Hi everyone, my name is Young Sun Pak. I'm a professor of international business and management at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. Also director of the Center for International Business Education called CYBE or CYBER. The CYBE was established in 2018 with a grant from the US Department of Education to serve as regional as well as national resources for students, faculty and business community through international business education, foreign language training, and research capacities. As part of our a virtual program during the COVID-19 pandemic, we introduced Global Business Insights video series that feature top business practitioners, executives engaged in international business to help our LMU students to better understand the career path in international business. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing one of the very successful American business executives residing in Seoul, Korea. Let me briefly introduce Mr. Bradley Buckwalter. Mr. Buckwalter is an American executive who has an extensive business experiences in East Asia, including Singapore, Japan, and Korea. He has lived in Korea for nearly 30 years, working as a top executive for American multinational corporations in building market. He had worked for Artis Elevator, ADT Security, Tyco International, and Johnson Controls. He is currently the CEO of the Black, Will Black Willow Meadow Real Estate Company. He has an MBA degree in finance and international business from Marriott School of Management, Brigham University in Salt Lake City in Utah State. Hi, Brad, good morning. Morning. Yeah, Let's just spend some time is, with you today. Yeah, it is really early morning there in Korea. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule. Not too long ago, you were one of our speakers for faculty development in the International Business South Korea program. You did such a great job. So I decided to interview for this, uh, our video series. So I'm going to ask a few questions related to your international business career. So here goes my first question. Okay, fire away. Okay, so what motivated you to pursue your career in international business? Um, did okay. You really, did you deliberately prepare your career or did it just happen by accident? Um, well, you know, some things in your career are going to happen by fate. That's for sure. Okay. However, the general direction did not happen by accident. Okay. Uh, when, when I was uh, 19 years old, a freshman in college, mm -hmm. uh, my mother uh, convinced me to uh, take some time off. And uh, I was a, uh, a Mormon missionary. Oh, you and missed. I had no idea where I was going to go. Uh -huh. And I came, this was in 1983. Mm -hmm. And Korea was a very, at the time, up and coming, but still a lot of, a lot of places were poor. And I came here and I, it was quite a shock for a young, a young American growing up in a protected environment of the States, but mm -hmm. it was very exciting. You learn a language, new culture, new people. Uh -huh. And I had such a great time that at that moment I decided, you know, we got a big world, a big wide world out there yeah. that I want to discover. And, uh, you know, I wasn't satisfied with the status quo um, in the United States. So when I finished my education, yeah. always in the mind, in my mind, it was, I want to work for the most international company possible and see as much of the world as I possibly can. So that was what I made up my mind. Okay. I'd never dreamed I was going to be in Korea for this long. Mm -hmm. You know, at, at first during my career, I had chances to come to Korea and I said, no, nah, I don't want to. And mm -hmm. that is why I ended up in Southeast Asia, right. but in Southeast Singapore, Asia, right? mm -hmm. I got to go to the uh, Philippines and Indonesia and Thailand and Singapore and see a lot of many, you know, many countries, but uh, things kept pulling me back to Korea. You know, when I was 19, I, at a young age, I, I could learn the language very well, right. pretty much fluently. And Korea was a up and coming uh, market. And my, it, I was in the building market mm -hmm. and Korea, you know, ever since I, I've been here has always been in the top five in the world for building markets. Right. You know, just recently, there was the Lotte Tower built. So I think it's the most recent 100-story building in the globe. And there's another one being planned right now with Hyundai Automobile. Uh -huh. you know, and so there's been all these buildings going on here. And so working for companies like Otis, 
who's number one in elevator and ADT number one security company, they right. require our products. And so it's been quite a run to, to work in such a, a country like this. You know? I see. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So you're missionary. And um, so how long have you spent as a missionary? Is it one year or two years in Korea? Um, at that time, it was a year and a half. Year and a half. And uh, I was 19. And when I say missionary, it wasn't a picnic. You know, it was more of a service to people who were unfortunate. So I was, I was in Seoul for one day. Okay. And Seoul at the time was a rather developed and a nice, a nice place. But I didn't spend my time in Seoul at all. I spent uh, my time on the southern tip of uh, Korea, mm -hmm. two hours, two and a half hours out of Busan in a place called Kojedo. Okay. And uh, I spent my time giving uh, shots to people who, who couldn't get shots. Uh -huh. um, during the uh, summertime, people needed help uh, fertilizing their rice fields. I um, mean, in the wintertime, um, I can remember it very cold. People don't have proper heating. So yeah. we would help them insulate their homes. Uh -huh. um, you know, we would go to some unfortunate areas and once a year, maybe uh, people in the countryside, we would give them a haircut, doing haircuts. Okay. So I described this to Koreans in 2021 and they say, this is another world. This is Mars. This is outer space. But, you know, it's, it was a true story and it's, it's, it's what I did. And I made a lot of friends and had a lot of uh, unbelievable experiences. And that's why I'm here today, you know. Sounds like you do have a lot of skills to offer. So that's quite interesting. Okay, um, I'm gonna get into a little bit more serious business uh, the, the questions. All right. Why do you think many American or even some global companies are struggling in conducting business overseas in general and in Korea in particular? To name a few, I can think, you know, company like Motorola, Yahoo, uh, Nestle, and Michelin, they all have a very small market share compared to their local competitors, or you may call that the, you know, local champions in Korea. So have you given any thought to this issue? Um, so that uh, maybe that you can give some good piece of advice for any companies who are already in Korea or in Southeast Asia market or East Asia market in general, so that uh, these companies can do a better job. Yeah. You know, uh, the U.S. is a gigantic economy, has the most successful companies in the world, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, hundreds and hundreds of multinational companies. And, you know, the problem is some companies at the very top, like Apple, yeah. like Google, mm -hmm. you know, these companies are so good that they take their business model uh -huh. in, that's successful in the United States and they have a, an attitude of one size fits all and they send it around the globe and they're very successful. And I think company like Apple, uh -huh. you know, like Google, um, like McDonald's, like Coca-Cola, they can do that yeah. because they're strong enough and you know, the countries will adapt to their business model. The right. problem is companies that may be not so strong as uh, those top five, those top tier, uh -huh. They cannot do business that way. One size does not fit, fit all. Okay. And, uh, you know, the key is you have to adapt your business strategy to the local environment. So, for example, countries with a similar open culture as the United States, like Hong Kong uh -huh. or Australia or New Zealand or Singapore, yeah. those countries, you take the U.S. business model and implement it, it usually works pretty well. Okay. The problem is, uh, for example, where Asia, where I've spent most of my career, China, mm -hmm. Japan, mm -hmm. and Korea. These are all gigantic markets, but they have unique business cultures, and they are very much different than the United States. And so some of that global model will work, mm -hmm. maybe 50%, but 50% you need to localize and adapt to the, the, the local way of doing business. And the problem is a lot of multinational companies, guys in the headquarters, they don't want to lose control or they don't understand it. Uh -huh. And so they fail. And so you, you, you mentioned a list of four or five companies. Yeah. You know, in the building market here, I personally watched Walmart. I mean, okay. in the U.S., it's by far the most successful uh, 
retail store everywhere in every city in the United States. Literally, Walmart came to Korea mm -hmm. and they took their business model and I watched them implement it to the letter exactly like it was in the U.S. Right. And after five years, they lost so much money, they decided to pull out. Correct. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is uh, still considered to be the one of the most publicized that, um, failure example um, that Walmart had to pull out from uh, South Korean market. Um, now let's move to the next question then. Um, you know, in academia, these days, so-called uh, global mindset has become a buzzword that describes the success formula in international business. So we do actually develop a lot of courses that incorporate uh, global mindset into the uh, curriculum. Um, generally speaking, uh, it consists of, uh, you know, three capital. The number one, it's called that individual properties or individual assets called the psychological capital. And the second one is the intellectual capital. And the last one we call the social capital. So you need to have a passion and curiosity to learn about other people and culture. Um, that's the psychological capital. If someone has to really have an individual um, you know, desire or passion to learn about the uh, new culture. You also need to know about your business and industry in the global market. Uh, business savvy or business acumen, uh, you can call the intellectual capital. And finally, you also need to build a trustful relationship with local people. Which one of these attributes do you think it's most difficult to develop in your opinion and why? You know, actually in our F FDIB program, uh, in a different kind of my way, I kind of uh, talked about those. Correct. Um, to be successful, the last one is building social capital in Korea is... Not, not the most difficult, but I would say the most critical. Okay. And I don't know if you remember, uh, you know, Mr. Peck, that uh, I spent a lot of time talking about as a foreigner, uh -huh. because, you know, you may have an advantage or a, dis a disadvantage, because right. um, they may want to push you away, they may not trust you, Correct. but you can also open a lot of doors. Uh -huh. um, but because I showed a lot of respect to the Korean culture, I learned the language and uh, try to learn as much about the culture as possible. That I'm able to, uh, you know, meet many people in many different corners of Korea, mm -hmm. and in in Korean in Korean life, um, business is different than in the West. When I said when I said the business culture is, in the West, it's more of family and and social is separately, and business is, is separate. You work nine to five and you go home and it's separate. In Korea, it's not that way. Okay. In Korea, your friends are your business associates. Mm -hmm. And your business associates on the weekend, we were talking about golf. Mm -hmm. If you meet a customer, your customers want to maybe so go play golf on the weekend. Or if you uh, are playing tennis uh, in, the, in the evening, you'll, usually uh, your customers will want to do that. Oh. because And so the, the Korean business culture and social culture is all in one. It's not separate like in the United States. So for Korea, for my situation, yeah. you know, maybe I don't, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question 100%, but the most critical in Korea is, you know, definitely social, you know, and creating those uh, networks and creating those uh, uh, relationships of trust. And if you do that over the long term, you know, uh, business becomes very easy in Korea because uh, people want to do business with people they know well and they trust. You know? Now, so you're saying that actually that the Korean people, they work and play with the same group of people. Yes. There's no separation between the work and pleasure. So more often than not, you kind of mix these two. I mean, you, yep. you, you work hard, but at the same time, you play hard with the same group of people. Yep. Because you're working hard and it's going to be tough. But in Korea, frankly, logistically speaking, because traffic and everything, when you go to, when you go to work, it maybe can take an hour, an hour and a half. When you go home, an hour, an hour and a half. Yeah. You, so you barely see your family and you're working so many long hours have a social life it usually centers around right. your business relationships and that's the reality of korea and so if somebody from the west comes to korea and says i'm gonna uh, 
you know, not socialize and not get to know my, my customers and I'm going to separate it and you have this kind of same mentality, you usually will fail in Korea. Like I, I uh, for example, the other day, you know, I haven't done business with them for two years, but uh, my clients from four or five years ago, I still meet on a social basis. Okay. Well, maybe today I don't have some business going on with them, uh -huh. but we, we, we've got to know each other and we got to like each other. Right. And, you know, I live a uh, downtown area. They'll give me a, hey, let's, let's go uh, and, uh, you know, have a cup of coffee or so. It's, it's popping soo in the sun and some ice, uh, some ice uh -huh. cream or something in the summertime. And this is Korean uh, culture. So that obviously, it will take your time and cost involved in continuing to maintain the relationship in Korea. So even though you mentioned a little bit about that, you know, importance of building the trustful relationship, if there was any specific sort of suggestions, this is how you build your own informal network. I know you are the member of the Amcham and uh, maybe that the Rotary Club yeah. or you play tennis or golf with uh, some of the, you know, the executives. But what would be your advice for those newcomers to Korea? Or as a matter of fact, that the country like, you know, Japan or other, you know, East Asian countries, this is a way you build your informal network because uh, at the beginning, you know, you're kind of what the outsiders, but um, how you kind of overcome that kind of disadvantage is not being the inside member of the uh, society. Yeah, you know, it's, I love, it's a great question. You know, the message I have is you have to treat this as something very important. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you do your uh, studies or your MBA school, you study accounting or, or you, you know, you study uh, finance just as it's critical to understand the nuts and bolts of, uh, you know, those kind of subjects, managing your social networks uh -huh. is every bit as important or even more important, I will say. Okay. So, you know, I always proactively mm -hmm. try to spend at least one third of my time building my social networks and it doesn't happen by chance. And so uh -huh. you mentioned a few that I, I talked to you about um, and you have to find common interests. Okay. You know, and so by any kind of person, mm -hmm. you know, it can differ, but you don't have to wait until a business career. When right. you're in your university days, mm -hmm. I would find something that you really like. And the more it's non-business, mm -hmm. the more it can be interesting. So if you, let's say, uh, you know, you like uh, going to some kind of drama pl plays or something or music. Yeah. And there's some kind of... Uh, and you go to some recitals once a week, you know, and getting into these kind of extracurricular activities at the university right. and meet many different people. Right. And then uh, they, and try to learn and you, you, you learn and you meet more people and you expand, mm -hmm. but you don't only focus on one area, yeah. you focus on as many as possible. So I didn't, maybe I didn't talk about it as much uh, in uh, you know, the previous discussion, but one of the areas I spent a lot of my time yeah. was, it's called the Asia Society oh, okay. in Korea. And, you know, the reason I liked it is because usually, you know, you go to AmCham and you go to Rotary Club and, you know, you go to these things and everybody wants to talk about the, the GDP growth and the, the economic outlook. And, right. but when I went to Asia Society, I remember the very first meeting I went to, mm -hmm. first of all, it was a different group of people, which okay. I normally did not have a chance to meet. And I found that they were very interesting and very friendly. And so the, the, at the Asia Society, there's a group of ambassadors there. Mm. And the first meeting they had was at the, the UK ambassador's house. And the subject was global warming. Okay. And, you know, and I sat there and, and I listened to what he had to say about global warming. And he was a little bit alarmist. Mm -hmm. And he talked about uh, the subject. But I, I realized you know, I'm a stupid businessman. You know, <laughs> I uh, I do business. Yeah. I convince these guys to buy a product. Mm -hmm. On the weekend, I go golfing, yeah. and I made and uh, I'm I'm not learning new things. And so yeah. I found Asia Society right. fantastic. And so I'm learning not only about uh, global warming, yeah. but uh, on another meeting, uh, the ambassador from Israel showed up and mm -hmm. talked about the Palestinian uh, you know conflict, sure. and uh, you know so many different subjects. And then, you know, frankly, in your mind, 
you know, you're a businessman. You're not expecting, uh, you know, business with these guys, but you find in, in your activities and when you get to know each other and you trust each other and you become close, suddenly those business opportunities pop up everywhere because they know you're a businessman and they know you're trying to, to grow your business. So, you know, that's, a, that's an example. But as many different uh, networking societies as possible my, is my strong recommendation to, and to do it systematically and plan for it. And look at your time. If you're not spending at least a third of your time doing that, then you're really, you know, uh, missing out on many opportunities. That's a very interesting, you know, uh, the perspective because uh, sometimes that, uh, you know, business managers focus on business and then whether he or she will, you know, the bring the money to our company. But you have to think about building the relationship first and broaden your perspective. And um, then maybe that, business will come sort of, you know, afterwards or the natural yeah. or flow, yeah. you know. In, in Korea, there's kind of an unwritten rule. If you have this kind of nine to five business and you only meet people during business and you separate your personal, you know, in Korea, let's say you show up at somebody's uh, office yeah. and you ask the, and you've never met them before mm -hmm. and you say, please buy this product. Mm -hmm. That's the worst possible thing you can do. Mm -hmm. It's a sign of disrespect to them, you know, and you will fail every time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I have two more questions to ask you. Okay. Uh, what do you think the U.S. companies can and should do to improve global competitiveness? Yeah. So we kind of talked about, uh, we started to talk about that, what the really successful ones do. Yeah. But, you know, let's talk about one of the, the top successful companies in Korea, Apple. Okay. You know, I think the, the market capitalization is number one. I think Apple is the, the largest, most successful company in the world. You can, I think Warren Buffet uh, has has forty percent of the stock in Apple. But you know something, Apple is not number one market share in Korea. Mm -hmm. How do you like that? You know, uh, and there's a reason. And if if I tell you the reason, uh, it's quite simple. Their uh, service, their after service, is very poor mm -hmm. compared to uh, Samsung. Uh -huh. And uh, compared to their product, compared to Samsung Galaxy, is uh, not liked by the Koreans. And you know, they're, uh, they're you know they do a lot of good things. I'm not saying Apple's a great company, and uh, you know I think as a as an American company in Korea, they're certainly not Yahoo or Walmart. I mean, they have a a 30 percent plus market share, which is probably the the best in Korea. Yeah. But still, in a market like Korea, a very difficult market, mm -hmm. um, like I mentioned, like Japan and Korea and, and China, they yeah. still have a lot of negative aspects. Okay. So if, if Apple is struggling like this, what about other uh, companies that maybe aren't as globally successful? Mm -hmm. So the point I'm making, you need a local strategy for the Korean market or the China market or the French market or or, uh, you know, these big, large markets that have very strong business cultures, you can't use the one size fits all American strategy. It will not work, you know. Uh, and so uh, companies that I've worked for, to be honest, and the reason I've been successful is I've been able to convince the headquarters that Korea is, first of all, a big market. It's worth the investment. You know, if you, if you make the proper investments and the proper uh, adaptations to the business model in Korea, it's worth it. You're going to make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and second of all, you have to have an open mind. It's going to be completely different. You're not going to understand it. Um, but if you, if you do it, you will be successful. For example, when you go to the U United States, um, you know, if you go to McDonald's, there's a quarter pounder with cheese or a Big Mac. No. From my house, I can walk to a McDonald's. It's three minutes from my house here. I go there from time to time. They have the Big Mac. They mm -hmm. have the Quarter Pounder with cheese. Sure, they have all that, and they're okay. But, you know, the most successful burger there is a Pool Kogi burger. Okay. You know, uh, and so they McDonald's has got it. They understand it. Mm -hmm. That you need to adapt your business strategy to what the Koreans like. And that's usually not 100% the U.S. model, you cannot adapt it as it is. So I think about 50% of that U.S. model, you adapt the 50% the local model, 
and you get a manager, you know, who needs, you said a global mindset, you know, they need to, you know, if you get a manager in Korea and he only wants to do 100% the Korean way, that's not going to succeed either because you need a global model. So you need a Korean manager who has a lot of experience working overseas and understanding the, the overseas model and also understands the local model and can kind of, you know, mold the two together and succeed. And mm -hmm. if I go company by company, the successful companies in Korea or even Japan or China, it's the same thing, or France, you know, uh, that's what they do. So you can, we used to say a word, I haven't heard it recently, it's called localization. Yeah, Global they, model, they, sure. but you need to localize it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, in the classroom that I use that term all the time and then uh, put on another way, we also call this as a cross versions. Yeah. It is not a convergence or it is not a divergence. Divergence is a local way of doing business and yeah. convergence is the what the, you consider the global market as if it's a one single market and then you apply the unified at them, uh, or universal approach and you have to solve find the kind of happy medium uh, between yeah. the two, right? Yeah. And, uh, um, I was going to ask that specifically that uh, in your opinion, what's missing uh, for Apple if they want to improve their you know, strategy in, in Korea? I'll tell you, I'm an American. Uh, my son has an Apple. I have a Samsung. And, you know, uh, I competed with Samsung for many, many years when I was at ADT. So, Mm -hmm. You know, but the reason I use a Samsung is very simple. If, and you use a smartphone, mm -hmm. from time to time, something goes wrong. You know, the charger you put in and sometimes it won't work. If I, and the mentality in Korea is after service is so, so fast and so good. Okay. If something ever goes wrong, uh -huh. I can walk across the street one minute and they'll have this thing fixed in 20, in, uh, before, in, in 30 minutes max. Okay. And in, in Apple, it's going to take you two hours to find an Apple service center. You go there, you're going to have to, it's going to take you 40 minutes to park. Yeah. It's going to, uh, you're going to have to wait in line for an hour and a half. I see. And you'll get it to them and they'll look at it for another hour. And then they're going to say, well, we're going to mail this to our, serv our, our engineers and we'll get it back to you in two weeks. That's okay. unacceptable in Korea. And so I will never accept that, you know. Okay. I, I got your point. Okay, here goes my final question. Um, do you have any, you know, piece of advice for our students regarding key critical global competencies that, so that they have to develop for their career success? Yes. Um, and I remember, it seems like yesterday when I was an MBA student uh -huh. and actually I graduated in the top 10% of my class. Wow. So I was totally <laughs> focused on marketing and statistics and accounting, had all those grades. And I was under the impression, if I learn all those subjects and I master them, I'm gonna be successful. Okay. But you know something, it, it's, it's not true. Hmm. You know, that is a given. Okay. Everybody will, will have that knowledge of those subjects. Correct. So whether you get in the top 10% or the top third, it's, it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. You know, my advice is focus on those soft skills Okay. that you will need throughout your career. So let me give you some examples. Um, I remember my last uh, semester of MBA, there was a course and some guys uh, were taking it, but I said, what is that? That's I'm not gonna waste my time. It was balancing personal and business life. Okay. You know, it's kind of a soft skill, yeah. time management. Right. Um, but to be honest, it always came to my mind is time, you only have so many hours in a day. Mm -hmm. And if, if I would have been doing more proper time management earlier in my career, it would have been very helpful to me. Or another one, mm -hmm. um, presentation skills. Okay. Literally in a company life, you know, uh, you're meeting customers every day and you have uh, the elevator speech. You have two minutes to convince them, uh, you know, to uh, meet you or, right. you know, open their mind. And, you know, presentation skills, you cannot be uh, better. And yeah. so uh, taking a, a course on presentation skills or even how to master PowerPoint to make this the oh. nice presentations, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and we talked about networking, you know, um, meeting people uh -huh. and, uh, you know, how, how to succeed politically in your organization, those soft skills, right. I can't uh, overemphasize. Right. It's right. absolutely even, I would say more critical than the hard skills. And so last thing, mm -hmm. 
people, especially students in the States, I highly recommend to learn a language. Okay. It doesn't matter the language. Mm -hmm. It's the mentality. You know, when I first came to Otis Elevator, very right. international company, um, the CFO of the company, he's retired now, he could speak seven languages, seven. Just like me. Yeah, maybe you, maybe you, maybe young, maybe you do, young son. You know, oh, and you I was shocked. Speak seven languages, but I had to learn the seven languages. I was proud of myself because I learned Korean, but I'm a. And you know something? <laughs> he was studying Korean to learn number eight. Wow. You know, so it's a mentality. I mean, it's it's more than the language. You right. may use that language or not. It's a mentality. When you learn the language, you learn the culture. You learn about people. You learn about their foods, and uh, you know, you do global business. Just a few words can help, you know, open people's hearts. So I say, absolutely, you need to learn, learn a language and have that mentality. Mm -hmm. And if possible, I didn't do an internship, but I did. I was a Mormon missionary. I was lucky. My mom kind of held the gun to my head and said, you go overseas. <laughs> and I saw it's a big world out there and people think differently. Right. And uh, I highly recommend, and I see a lot of students in Korea do this nowadays. They didn't do this in the old days. But if I see... Uh, Students, the young generation now, they will almost always spend, you know, at least one or two semesters in the UK or New Zealand or even the US. And I highly recommend that. Sure, great. I mean, during the pandemic, we try to offer international virtual internship opportunity for the students. So maybe for the future, with your, you know, network, uh, hopefully that uh, we'll be able to play some of our students that they're working for the, you know, some American the, uh, the, the companies. Yeah. Um, that would be great. Yeah, there's no excuse. I mean, from being in Korea 20 years ago, you didn't see this. But like last year, I can name at least 10 MBA schools that are doing mm -hmm. programs like yourself. UCLA, yeah. Georgetown was here, uh, even during, you know, doing some virtual things like you're doing. Uh, yeah. Everybody does it. And makes me happy that they respect Korea. Korea is viewed as a big market now, so. Okay, uh, Brett, I know that uh, you have many other things that, that um, you can talk about. Uh, you're really a dynamic speaker, but- um, uh, Are you serious uh, today? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to uh, smile a little bit. Yeah. So thank you again uh, for sharing your great experiences and critical insights. Uh, into international business. And I hope that uh, your interview uh, inspired many LMU students uh, who are considering pursuing their career in international business. Okay. Yeah. Thanks so, a lot. It was a lot of fun. Until I see you again, uh, please stay safe and healthy. Okay. Yeah, me too. Great. Me too. Thank you so Have much. Right. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye.